sure. That'd be great. Welcome to the Making Home uh, Contemporary and Devised Performance in Pittsburgh session. We are so happy to have you here with us today. My name is Chanel Blanchett. I am the Programming Manager at Kelly Strayhorn Theatre as well as the Multidisciplinary Theatre Artist. And I am so, so excited to be here today talking to Adil Mansour and Lindsay Gable. Before we get into what I'm sure will be a very, very cool discussion with these wonderful artists, I am going to pass it over to a representative from TCG talk about a little housekeeping. Okay. Hello, and thank you for joining us all today. Uh, my name is Oscar Emily Cabrera. I am the Office and Technical Support Coordinator for TCG. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm here to say uh, welcome on behalf of TCG, uh, and to just go over a quick uh, few housekeeping items. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us. This session has been uh, is uh, captioning, and we will be dropping instructions for how to take advantage for these, of these resources uh, in the chat for Zoom. Um, I'm here to help support today, so if you're having any Zoom trouble issues or having any questions, feel free to message me privately. Um, I'll also keep an eye on chat, and we can answer questions from there. Uh, I also want to let everyone know that TCG is recording uh, the full group uh, parts of this session, um, and with that, you. Thank you, Oscar. Um, so during this session, we will talk about devised contemporary performance through the lens of the work of these two wonderful artists. And before we do that, I would like to talk a little bit about where um, the title of the session came from. Um, and also, I want to acknowledge that um, this session, this talk, this conference is happening on the land of the Seneca people and the Osage Nation. Um, but I also do want to name the fact that um, land acknowledgments um, don't hold the weight they need to hold without um, active actions follow them up. Um, so, it's over there. Um, so, um, a little bit about Kelly Strayhorn. Our mission is to be a home for creative experimentation, community dialogue, and collective action rooted in the liberation of black and queer people. Um, and we take inspiration from the cultural tradition of black homemaking, and we believe that the work we do is rooted in intersectional and anti-oppression, and that that's of the utmost importance. And so this idea of taking inspiration um, from the cultural tradition of black homemaking um, pulls a little bit from um, Bell Hooks' work, Home Place, where the idea of home place is where home is the a place where you have the opportunity to grow and develop, to nurture our spirits, and to make home is to make a community of resistance, especially for people who hold marginalized identities. And so that's a little bit of where the idea for the title of the session came from, this idea that um, through art, through work, through the work of these two artists, we're really creating um, a new definition of, of home, a space for people to grow and learn and express themselves and their identities. But I also want to name that for some, home is a really complicated concept. Um, it can be a site of deep-seated and repressive conditions. Um, but, like ballroom culture of Black and Latinx queer and trans people, we persist by making a home that upholds and, affir and affirms the expansive definitions of identity and artistic forms. So, enough for me. Um, I want to pass it over to the artists to talk about themselves. So, uh, first up is Liam B. Gable. Liam, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, I'll first say that I'm coming like straight to you from tech for the production that's happening this evening. Oh um, and so uh, forgive me for any sort of like um, haze that's in my mind <laughs> coming up on stage to me. Um, but yeah, I'm Liam. And um, disclosure is complicated, but I'm a trans theater maker. I say that because it's really important to my practice um, and the aesthetics and the way that I work. Um, and I lived in New Orleans for eight years before coming to Pittsburgh. I feel really artistically baked in New Orleans. I grew up in Maryland. And after uh, coming, I, or I moved to Pittsburgh for grad school, and so I've been here for four years. I make a lot of work about archives. I do long um, 
processes where I do oral histories and then create performance from those oral histories, although it's not strict documentary performance. It's kind of docu-fiction or docu-fabulation. It's a hybrid between narrative and um, documented work. And uh, in that work, it's really important to me to build uh, collectives around it, communities and all of their complication. Um, and so I was really excited by the name of this uh, session um, because I think thinking about home and community and how those things, how those networks of care can get built inside of a rehearsal room have been really important to my practice and also my livelihood as an artist making performance. That's what I'll say. Awesome. And the information for uh, Liam's show, which is tonight um, at Kelly's Rayboard, so everyone should come, um, is up on the screen here. There's also a link um, that I'll show at the end of the presentation that'll have um, a way for you to buy tickets for both of these performances. Um, and for anyone who's joining us via Zoom, um, there's a PDF of the slides that will be popped into the chat where you can click on those links. Next up is Adil. Hi folks, my name is Adil, like let's make a deal. <laughs> um, he's like been with me for 30 years now. Bad <laughs> slogan. Uh, I use he, him, his pronouns. Come in, come in. Come join us. Thank you. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a theater director uh, who is pretty obsessed with the dramaturgical process. Uh, I direct new and contemporary plays and I make my own work. I was raised outside of Chicago. I moved to Pittsburgh 12 years ago, um, and I fell in love with this town. There's a lot I can say about it, good and hard and bad and beautiful. Um, and I kind of came through the museum world here in Pittsburgh, and I work a lot with queer and trans teens here in Pittsburgh. I'm really grateful to them for all that they have taught me. Um, and I am now making my own work. I feel like myself more and more, which I'm really grateful for. The show that's happening tomorrow night at the Warhol is called Amigon. It's an adaptation of Antigone as an apology to and from my mom. <laughs> uh, it uh, explores queerness, the afterlife, um, obligation, uh, faith, and family through the lens of Antigone with uh, references to the text with me nerding out about being a teacher and audio conversations with my mom and I. Um, it is trying to perform dramaturgy. We talk about the play, which means we talk about hardship, and then all of a sudden we learn about each other, which we all know as theater makers that happens when you're doing a dramaturgical process. Uh, and I, as a maker, have gotten really excited about presenting that process on stage. How do I actually capture that essence when I'm making the work I'm making? And so that's a little bit about me. As someone who's seen both of these works, I'm so excited to see Liam's for the first time live tonight, but I've seen a recording and I've seen Adil's many times live. I've cried um, like this is so good tears each time. I highly, highly, highly encourage um, everyone to see both of these amazing pieces. Um, and so what I want to do now is really segue into giving um, Liam and Adil a, a chance to talk a little bit more about their process, about their experiences in um, the Pittsburgh arts community, um, and a little bit about the shows themselves. So I wanted to start off by asking the two of you if you could talk a little bit about your devising processes and how maybe that intersects or even diverges from the way you, you um, create if you're working with canonical or scripted work. Uh. I'll start with the work I was doing with Dreams of Hope, which is a queer and trans youth arts organization here. And I feel like they taught me devising more than anybody else ever has. Uh, we, I got to work with about 30 queer young folks every year, and we would devise an original piece of theater. And it was based on queer theory, queer history, queer lived experience, and they would make what they wanted to make. What I learned in that process that's become pretty baked in, I'm obsessed with folks looking at art. It was always in looking at something, witnessing a painting, witnessing a poem, that like the most dynamic conversations erupted. And then the, my process has become trying to capture that, trying to understand that as the material that we've made. And so a lot of my devising and generative work comes out of looking at something. And that is where it comes from. So when I'm thinking about scripted practice, they're deeply related for me. I love working on plays, I love working on scripts. I was like a script, I was like, 
one of the script nerds in my program, which was super generous, like most, a lot of divisors. Uh, I see them as really integral to each other. I feel like for a lot of my career, I was asked, or I felt like I was had a pressure to pick between like a devising director or a scripted director, as if they're two very separate jobs. I do not feel that way. I feel like they feed each other. I get really excited to, like I can say it, I'm excited to look at Chekhov and understand the art, and like I think a climax is relevant. Like I'm like, happy to know beginning, middle, and end. And then when I look at device or contemporary performance and thinking about space, time, action, audience, like all those uh, ways of looking at work also get me excited. Or looking at sculptor, or looking at painting, like all of those things. So I feel like my devising process is interdisciplinary. Uh, and right now I've become a little bit upset. This is the last thing I'll share. I've, I've become obsessed with looking at canonical work. I used to kind of be like, ideally you have to get girl out of that. But I can admit to you that that's what raised me. Like, the sitcom Friends raised me, Tennessee Williams raised me, and I need to contend with those realities and a way to become who I want to become. And so I'm trying to connect those with things that raised my parents, which are very, very different things. And so, you know, I have a dream about working on The Tempest as much as I want to, like, hate that play. I also recognize <laughs> that there's a lot about colonialism in that text that's worth mining and exploring, and how can I dig into it um, specifically, like when Caliban is cursing the English that he's been taught as a way to understand my own relationship to English and what English has done to my body and what English has done to my family. Like it's, I dreamed in Urdu first, and I don't know how to speak it now. So that means something, or I can't really know how to speak it now. Um, so that's where the can kind of reverberates what I'm working. I'm down for this exploration of the Tempest. It's like my mom's favorite Shakespeare, I'm named after it, so I've done this exploration from, like, first in line for a ticket. <laughs> Liam, what about you? Uh, I mean, so much, so much similarity, I feel like, in, like, specifically the way that I feel like devising practice, or contemporary performance practice, and new work development, and new script development, um, like, feeds each other in my practice. I've always had these two streams. I've made my own work, uh, usually with big groups of people, um, but lately more and more kind of spearheading those processes. I come out of ensemble work, I come out of DIY theater, um, and moving more into a space of like creating work that I feel like I'm offering, but still creating it in this devised process. Uh, but I also uh, work with playwrights to make new plays. And to me, those two processes feed each other because when I'm working on uh, devised work or contemporary performance, I get to really nerd out about all the tools of the theater, the mechanisms, and like how they fit together, and how like visual dramaturgy functions, and the way that like lights can be storytelling, the way that like, um, yeah, the, that sound and all of those things kind of work together to create, to time travel us, to like place travel us, and so I'm working with those elements in this like really complicated, messy way, and those feel like my primary ingredients. And then when I'm working with playwrights on new text, all of a sudden it's like words, and I'm thinking about story, and I'm thinking about arc, and I'm thinking about beats. Um, and those things become dominant, so then like I just kind of try to let those two things feed each other, um, and that's been really, yeah, recognizing that and making it dominant has been transformative. Um, yeah, like I said, I come out of kind of DIY theater and ensemble practice, in New Orleans, a lot of my devising practice comes out of the fact that I felt like the stories of my communities and the stories that I wanted to tell weren't out there in scripted form, which is like true and not true, I know now. You know, there are also amazing playwrights working on things. But I felt like, oh, okay, where, where are these sorts of stories that I want to be telling? And the way that I knew how to do it was like find a bunch of weirdos who wanted <laughs> to, uh, uh, to mess around for a while. Um, and figure out how to how to find some resource in order to do that, um, and just like having a practice of like getting together in a room and mucking about with like tech in our bodies uh, and failing. <laughs> I feel like that is actually um, the process that I'm engaged in. Uh, yeah, yeah, and being obsessed with and confused by my own body has made me like obsessed with and confused by like body in space. Um, and body in relationship to history, and those things have become a part of my, my practice as well. I tend to do really large projects, and so like I worked on a musical called Alleged Lesbian Activities that was about um, 
the closing, the close, closing of Dyke Bars in New Orleans. That project had like 50 plus people who were involved in it. And so I really like those big collaborations because I feel like, again, like theater has this really incredible ability to create networks of care uh, that can help to sustain us. I think it has to, unfortunately, because it does not sustain us in other ways sometimes, <laughs> financially, um, which is something that I know a lot of people are working to remedy. Um, yeah, but there is something that I have relied on it to do since a very early age, which is like make home and like literally sustain me through those networks. And so that's a part now of the active process that I'm engaged in when I'm making work. So it's not just about like what we're making, but also about the connections that we're making with one another as we're making it and being really intentional about how those can be things that help to sustain the process. Thank you. I, I'm thinking a lot about the importance of, of home and the creation of home and, and also community um, that I, I see in both of your work and hearing both of your responses. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what your experience has been, has been creating within um, the Pittsburgh community, making sort of this specific work within the Pittsburgh community, um, and even maybe what that's like creating that work with the specific artistic teams that you have. Because mm -hmm. um, I know that you two have been collaborators on things, you've built um, friends and networks through who you've worked with, and so how does that um, sort of fit within making work within Pittsburgh with an eye towards device work? Yeah. So I can be transparent and say that I haven't been in Pittsburgh that long. Um, and so my response is really colored by the fact that I came here four years ago. I came here for graduate school. I was at Carnegie Mellon. And then um, I've stayed really engaged in the Pittsburgh community, but I've also started teaching at the university level. So I teach at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So I'm going back and forth between out of town, but I've gotten to spend like all spring in Pittsburgh making work. So that's been really amazing. Something that's really incredible to me about the Pittsburgh arts community is that there is here for artists making work, which is not true everywhere. Um, and so getting to experience that has been really transformative for my practice. Uh, not that I was not, did not have any access to resources, but in New Orleans, a lot of the access to resource comes from national funding organizations. And in Pittsburgh, there's a robust local funding and foundation network. Um, and so that is something that feels really unique to the ecosystem of here. Yeah, it's so interesting, the question about artistic teams. Because I, I was just talking this morning about like, oh, I just basically do theater so I can like hang out with my friends. That's <laughs> 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 very fun. Uh, and I, I wish I had something more eloquent to say right now, maybe I will later, but just that like, uh, yeah, what it is to like, there's something transformative about finding a question <laughs> Like for the dance floor, the hospital room, and the kitchen table, I was just like, what does it mean to take care of ourselves, each other? <laughs> How do we do that when it feels like the world is falling apart? <laughs> Who might know something about that? And I started talking to people about the 80s, um, especially in the queer community. And that question was really activating for me. And I found it be activating for other people. And that process of sharing that question together and like looking for the answer collectively has been really transformative. So I guess that's not about Pittsburgh, but that's what feels magic about, about community. The team. Yeah. <laughs> I think community yeah. and creation is important. It's what can ground us in the work that we do and help us find how we want to create and what we want to say. So I think it's it, it can be local, but it can also be emotional across, you know, distance and time and all of those things as well. I have to plus one what Liam said about resource and support. Um, coming from Chicago, there was a sense of um, access that felt different here. There's still all kinds of barriers, of course, but I specifically think about in terms of the resource, I specifically want to name um, got the Kelly Street North Theater and New Hazlitt. And they're both you know, traditionally more presenting organizations that were even veering towards rental organizations before I moved here. And in the last decade, they both really focused on supporting emerging creators across disciplines in Pittsburgh. So the Kelly Story Harness programs across like the, all kinds of programs, and the one I really want to honor is Fresh Works, where every year, I think six different artists 
have the opportunity to have a month-long residency, money, technicians, folks behind the work, and like curatorial help, right? And thinking like, there's this thing Ben is amazing at, that is, Ben's over there. Um, He's our program and director, he's great. Like I was so fortunate to get to work with Ben early in my project with Omegon where he was able to send me other work to look at, to think about form, to think about other ways. And it was never like work that was like, about the exact thing I was talking about. It was work that like spurred my imagination in ways that I didn't know was even possible. And that's something I think Kelly Storyhorn does really well, and it's like getting people to collide ideas. And it's an entry level artist program that is ready to support you know, teens, folks that are new to a discipline, folks that are new to a collaboration, or folks that have been doing whatever they're doing for decades. Like it really does the jam. And then the new Hazlitt has a program called Fresh Works that also, no, thank you, CSA. <laughs> called CSA that supports, again, six emerging artists or emerging projects, and it comes with a couple month residency, the ability to have a two evening performance, and a lot of those projects keep moving forward. So that, I think, is huge when I think about what Pittsburgh does. And I think it's worth noting at TCG that both of those are more contemporary performance or presenting theaters. They're not producing theaters in the same way. And I bring that up because when I moved to Pittsburgh, if I'm totally honest, I'm like nervous to say it out loud, but it is just true, the, 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 the barrier to access when it came to entering the theater community here was high. I didn't know how to enter a theater. I didn't study it in undergrad. I wasn't an actor. I couldn't afford a free internship. I couldn't apply for the job. I, like, I, just, I was like, how the fuck do I do this? And so the people that like welcomed me were dancers and silkscreen printers and museum workers. And so my practice was developed up in other disciplines. I knew theaters where I felt the most alive. That kept being true. And I'm really grateful there was a theater in Pittsburgh, Quantum, that like responded. I sent 100 emails when I moved here, and one person responds, and that was Carla. And she's like been a mentor since that moment. But I grew up in other disciplines in Pittsburgh. And so at that point in my life, that felt hard. Um, it didn't feel good. I was like, this, this thing, the, the one place I want to be, all the doors were closed. <laughs> and I don't know what to do here. And now, 10 years later, thank God. Like, I'm so grateful that that's where I learned. And I'm so, it's like, to, like, to have DJs as your sound designers and architects as your set designers teaches you a lot. Uh, you like, really figure out what you're trying to do. So because of that, I am really grateful to Pittsburgh. And now, and now I can be like, transparent, I feel. I'm just, like I'm starting to understand the theater world a lot more, and I'm starting to be able to. I mean, I have an MFA in directing, and that's real privilege, and that's real access. Like I understand all those. I understand what that means, and in that position, to like think about teams. You all know this. I think about this. Our budgets and who we hire is our mission. It is like deeply embedded in our mission. So the folks on our team is me evoking my mission. If my mission is to make queer work for people of color, my team better be queer folks and people of color. And that makes the work feel amazing to have a room full of queerdos who are all crying about our moms when I'm crying about my mom. That's golden, right? <laughs> great. But it also meant Liam, Liam co-directed the show, and he was like one, one of my best friends in the world. So like, but Liam and I were really strategic about bringing on as many emerging folks as we could and pairing them with super experienced folks and figuring out, and Liam was really great about being, okay, like the channel needs to be really clear. We have three people working on media, but one in projections, one in the video, and one on the systems design with very different levels of experience strategically. The whole point was to get more folks, more experience. Um, and to like try to be a part of fueling the theater community we want to be a part of and we want to see. And that strategy happens at every level. So that's something I'm like, you know, grateful I get to talk about. Yeah, no, I. I'm just so struck listening to the two of you talk about not only your process, but the way you build community within that process and hearing about the different ways in which you sort of pull from different disciplines, different areas in the creation of this work. You were talking about finding community and like people who worked in museums and, and screen printing. And Liam, I was hearing you talk about how you have this big network of people that are friends that you just want to make work with and, and take advantage and then and learn from their talents. And so, 
I I notice having have seen having seen both of these shows that they both um, intertwine the the physical and the ephemeral and the analog and the digital and all of these different forms in order to tell um, these stories that are about identity and memory and legacy. And so, how has this intersection of form helped you shape those discussions within the work? So, both of our shows, but my show was, you know, the sausage was made through quarantine, <laughs> right? Like I started the project before quarantine, and here I am working on the other side of it, and we kept making. And I was really lucky because it was about how I talked to my mom. And a lot of the way I talked to my mom is text messages and emails, right? She discovered my queerness on Google. So, like, the internet and the computer is intrinsically a part of the thing you're talking about. So when it came time to try to make work in quarantine, it wasn't a huge departure, and there were questions we could ask on the screen that felt embedded in the show. Um, and that has taught us a lot about the show. And the one thing I'll share, I think because of making in quarantine, because we're making with digital tools and analog tools, for me it's real, even though my show is about memory and it's about being five years old with my mom, like it's about me as a kid, the show feels of right now. It was made in the now, it was made with the tools of right now, including quarantine, and it's so present at this moment. And even I've now performed it 12 times in three different places, and, I, and it's not it's less scripted and more lesson plan, which means I'm able to react to the news that morning, I'm able to react to the person sitting in front of me, I'm able to react to like the fight my boyfriend and I had that afternoon, or whatever is happening in my life, that can get fed into the show um, in a way that I'm really grateful for. So I, all those tools for me just make it super present, is what I'm thinking. I come out of, uh, in some ways, out of physical theater and like done even more dance pieces as a performer. Um, and I, when I started working on like more community based work, when I was like, okay, the important thing is that I'm in a room with a multi generational room with people who are new performers and people who are more seasoned performers, right? Not actors and non actors because everybody, if they're acting, they're acting. <laughs> but like newer actors and more experienced actors. So if I want to make these mixed rooms, then I can't do the things that I was doing before, which is like making people do really difficult physical exercises in order to make work. Um, and especially like in these non air conditioned warehouses that I was working in. <laughs> <laughs> Like, how do I start to think about, and I got really bored with the uh, homogeny of bodies that I was seeing in a lot of physical theater. Um, so I was like, okay, what, do I, what happens here? And um, so I started changing the practice, and one of the things that started to become really interesting to me was, okay, what if the focus is still on the body, but the, but the processes that the body is going through aren't like doing six flips, <laughs> but are like um, tasks. And how does like a focus on task and a focus on the mechanisms of the theater um, create the ability for a performer to be present? <laughs> and how can that start to drive narrative and storytelling? So that's what I've become interested in now. So that's kind of like the analog and the digital start to combine because right now the mechanisms of the theater are analog and digital <laughs> and the, the tasks can be analog and digital um, and so i've gotten really interested in like machine shows <laughs> or shows that like we build with everybody in the room all together all of the designers and the performers for the first week and build it that way and then rehearse with just the performers to be like okay now that you know your task what's your action <laughs> um, what are we, what's the story, and what's the emotion, but now you have the arc, the physical arc that can help you get through it, because that was so helpful to me as a performer, and then doing an uh, actual tech week after that. So it's a different way of making work um, that has become really exciting to me. Uh, yeah, that's, so that's like the, the way it's constructed, and then on a kind of like um, more kind of maybe metaphysical level, if I'm just like so nerdy about archives, and I think that like right now, the digital is where we're archiving, and like what are we gonna do with all this, these recorded Zoom calls, y'all? There's so much of us floating around the internet. It's this, 
this very conversation. <laughs> it's wild. We're like building the archive all the time digitally, but also like the archive that I'm interested in is so material. And so this collision of the material world that I'm still so connected to and almost nostalgic for being like a millennial and then the digital world that feels like just the soup that we're swimming in right now. Um, yeah, it's invigorating to me as an artist and it's especially like in dance floor um, is something that we were really interested in. Yeah, well, you're both giving me a lot to think about. I almost, I almost wish that I was like not leaving the spot to take notes. Um, <laughs> but um, I think something that really strikes me about the work that the, the two of you have done is, or and are doing because you're still creating and evolving, um, the works are, um, there's a sense of using, I guess, what you're both interested in personally to also have um, something to say, something to share with a, a community that you care about, with the community that you care about. And so I wonder if you can speak a little bit about the, what the importance is of telling these specific stories that you're telling with these two pieces in the specific way you're telling them for the community that you want to share it with, whether that be Pittsburgh, whether that be you're very specifically talking to your family or your friends or the queer community that you care about. Why do you, how do you feel that it's important to tell it in this specific way for the two of you? The amazing thing to me about performance, whatever, this is something that we all know, I'll just say it because it, when asked this question, what else to say? Um, is that, uh, it means that people have to come together <laughs> in a room. Um, I, I'm not always, I do, I'm, I'm like here for the ways in which we connect digitally and remotely, and I'm really excited about the access that that gives, especially as somebody who has lived my life outside of New York. Um, like I'm really pumped for everything that the digital world is giving to performance, but, um, Repeat your question. I know. I was, I was literally just as you were saying. I was like, I don't remember the question that I asked. So I will ask because it I again for both of us. Um, what's the importance of telling uh, the story of the dance floor, the hospital room, the kitchen table in the specific way you're telling it, in form, in idea, for the community that you care about? Oh yeah. So the reason I'm interested in making queer history plays, queer history performances is because it's a way to get queer community in a room gathering and like processing through our bodies this history in some way. Like witnesses process through the body, performers process through the body. And so we're all like figuring out these stories together. And because the stories on stage tend to spark more stories in the audience and there are conversations that happen afterwards. So I think performance has this transformative ability to, again, make those networks. Yeah, and then there's been something so interesting to me, again, about activating a question and then gathering a group of people around it. And then usually something happens, <laughs> like something transformative happens in these processes. I've done a few of them so far that have been these like deeply researched um, pieces. Like Dance Floor has 32 oral histories that I did as a part of it and a bunch of archival research. And when I was researching, I read the Lou Sullivan Diaries for the first time in the GLBT archives and had this really transformative experience. Um, in my life, and so now that's that's on stage, and that's kind of my way of like inviting those sorts of connections with the material is to just embed them in the work, <laughs> and then uh, hopefully get the audience. I remember I used to like get really nervous about the question, "Who's your work for?" I think it's for everyone, isn't it? Like, isn't that what I want? <laughs> and with this project, with the person, I was like, "Oh, this play is for my mom." <laughs> If there's a person that I can really think about, and that is the audience member that I want to make every decision around. So when we have an aesthetic question of like, even if it's like this rug or this rug, it's like, which one would my mom like? It's like part of the decision making. And when I'm thinking about the language in the play, so earlier, earlier iterations, so much, I was explaining so much of it in English. I was like, well, this isn't a play for Urdu speakers at all, is it? Like, Urdu speakers don't need all this explanation, and so, our team worked really hard to figure out what places do we need to translate for legibility, because my audience won't be 100% Urdu speakers, but what are the ways I can also choose to not translate or be really elegant and strategic and embrace that, you know, I hope Urdu speakers will come to the show, 
and that they should have their own version of the experience and they don't need to filter every word my mom says in her mother tongue. And so sing singling out an audience member has been kind of revolutionary for me. And it's, it's helped me be like, okay, I'm not gonna change the world. <laughs> I'm not trying to, but maybe my mom and I can nerd out about theater for like an hour and have a good time. And that is like worth it. And then like the circles of community kind of, you know, ripple out of my mom. So of course I want the show to be seen by queer Muslim folks and their family members. And the whole theaters I've gotten to present with were so, such, gave me such gifts. They gave the projects of gifts. Ben, ben worked really hard with Chanel to host an iftar party as a part of our presentation at the Kelly Stringhorn. So my show happened during Ramadan this year. And when we realized that scheduling reality, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> And there's like, do we move the thing? I was like, wait, actually, let's just embrace the moment, right? Ramadan is a feast breaking time. And so we worked with Pittsburgh leaders and Muslim leaders and curated an evening where 50 Muslim folks, or 50 folks, many coming from South Asian communities, Muslim communities, queer communities, got together, broke baths together outside, then rented us a tent and figured out all the city ordination because COVID, right? And then I got to pray namaz for the first time in 20 years with other queer Muslims. I was like, what's happening to my body? Mm -hmm. And then when, as a kid, I would have gone to the mosque and had two hours of prayer, I put my plight on. I was like, well, this is it. This is the thing. And getting to do it in Boston, the queer Muslims of Boston like showed up in full force. And so getting to work with that audience, I mean, that's just transformative for my body to be like, oh, that, that experience is shared and divergent. Like in a room of 10 queer Muslims, we have 10 very different queer Muslim experiences. That being said, the, the, I'm teching the show right now and there's this wonderful person who doesn't share any of those lived experiences with me. And they like missed a major cue today. And then they were sweetly like, I just see myself in your show. Like I get, I'm not gay or any of those things, but I just see myself in this thing. And I, now I know, and I'll get the cue. <laughs> I was like, it's all good. So I, you know, we all have people we love with different beliefs. Like we all have experience what that means. And so, I don't know, that's me nerding out about your question, I think. I mean, I could listen to both of you nerd out all day, every day so. Um, no worries. Um, but I, I'm really curious, as you, you both keep developing these pieces and your practice and whatever amazing things you go on to do in art, what are the ideas and questions that you want to keep sparking conversations about? I'll do two. One content, one industry. Content-wise, okay, I've just been thinking a lot about, uh, ooh, this is what I've been thinking about. <laughs> Where did I learn about sex? And when I think about it, most of the sex conversations I learned was from television, health class, and white folks. And so, of course, I grew up separating my sexuality completely from my immigrant realities. My parent had desire, right? Their ancestors desired things. <laughs> like, of course we did, and of course we do. So I'm desperate to know about Daisy desire. Um, I want to know, like, I'm trying to write, I, I'm, I really want Daisy dads to give me the sex talk. My dad passed away seven years ago, so he can't anymore. I wish he could. Even at 36, I, like, would welcome it. So he can't. And so I'm curious if, like, fathers that make me think about my dad, if they would talk to me about it. <laughs> Is what I'm thinking about. So that's just really honest, and that's what that is. Uh, yeah, I can't. All just comes from sitcoms, right? Like that's not working. Right. And then in terms of the, in terms of our field and the industry, something I'm just I think we're all thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Is how tired we are, and how gray it feels often, and the exhaust that. Is, is a lot, and I'm, my peers are, and colleagues, I'm, uh, talking to them is like heartbreaking, because um, the last two and a half years have been a lot in all kinds of ways, and it's accumulated from across time, and our systems are so broken that I'm watching my friends break. It can't keep happening. <laughs> like, I, like, just burn it down if that's the only thing that's gonna happen, or like, what, what? so I, as a field, am just desperate to figure out, like, what can we do to instigate joy, even if it's just tomorrow, or next week, or next year? 
Like it feels like a really big puzzle and it's like such a cheesy question maybe, but I want to keep making this work. I want to keep making it with you all. I, I would really like to have joy while we do this very, very hard job. Um, and so whatever are the ways to center joy and care without shifting away from rigor. I don't think those words are the opposite of rigor at all, ever. I actually think they're intrinsically the same or connected. And so as a field, how do we find joyful rigor and care? Hear that. Thank you for that, for sharing that, that honesty and that vulnerability. Um, I'm really interested in, I feel like often when I talk about being a trans artist and not being really integral to my practice, often people are like, content, that means you want to do plays about trans things. And that um, is true. And also, I'm really interested in what it means to think about trans aesthetics and think about queerness as aesthetics um, and think about like what, what we're actually bringing to the table when we talk about identity that isn't just like um, a checkbox, but is like, okay, what is the fullness of that thing and how does it show up in the work even when the work isn't really explicitly talking about that. Um, so that, um, I'm also on the joy train. <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm interested in a lot of my work kind of ping pongs between um, thinking about cycles of trauma and ambiguous grief and how we break those things. And then thinking about like how we create containers for a radical celebration. Um, so I'm, the next piece that is uh, coming uh, down the pipe is a sound walk with stories of uh, trans and queer euphoria that happen in nature. So like kind of planting those stories in natural spaces uh, via geolocated sound technology and letting people experience them. Um, yeah, because of naturalness and those things. Uh, yeah. those, those questions, those questions. Also, also rigorous care, joy. Rigorous care. <laughs> I want to I hold that for a second, this idea of rigorous, rigorous care. Thank you both for speaking about that and especially I think now in art making it is hard to think about what joy looks like amidst rigor amidst the things that we want to say about our our lives and our experiences and so to hear both of you frame the frame the question in that way is really invigorating so thank you I'm gonna look to Oscar and ask do we have a time for a few questions we do yeah awesome um, so if anyone would like to ask any questions of uh, Adil or Liam, um, please raise your hand if you're in the, the 3D room, um, the 3D space. Um, I stole that from um, Elena um, from TCG. She was saying that in an earlier session because everyone's in the room, whether you're joining us virtually um, or here in the physical space. But if you have a question in the 3D space, uh, please uh, raise your hand, call out. Um, and if you are joining us uh, virtually via Zoom, you can um, type it in the chat or um, uh, Maybe raise your hand with the raise your hand function, and Oscar will help us coordinate that. Um, so, any questions or thoughts? Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question. When you were writing your play for your mother, sorry, I'm missing you. Um, so it's it's your own words, right? I mean, how many times did you go over that script and then like think about here's another memory maybe, and then how do I put this in there, what fits in here, what doesn't, and and then to have that memorized in a way, because it's your words, so you can play with it all over. So what was that process like for you to write your story and then present? Totally. I'm so grateful for that question, and the two people that have like really shaped it are in this room right now, which is like really great. <laughs> so the first time I did the show, I did, or my first iteration was 15 minutes and it was super scripted and super memorized and like trying to push buttons and do the thing. And Ben watched it and Ben very soon was like, you're not an actor, <laughs> but you're an amazing teacher. Like how can the performance you have when you teach, right, that is the performance, mm -hmm. how can that like really filter through this thing? And he really opened my eyes to thinking about that. And so then I started doing a deep dive into like lecture performance and thinking about the aesthetics of pedagogy and in the classroom is where I feel the most alive. But I also know that if I'm not making art while I'm teaching, I become a bad teacher. 
So those two things are just so deeply rooted and connected to each other that I was like, okay, I really need to think about this as a lesson plan. And that gives me this like space to breathe. Where I'm like, I know what my objectives are. I know the arc of the thing. And after I've, you know, I've taught intro to directing seven times now, and that's it's there's. Class. <laughs> that's <laughs> taken it. Let me look at you like that. Those are so many of the conversations. And what that's filtered through is now I have a script that's, I don't know, eighty-five percent, pretty consistent, maybe even ninety percent. But little pieces of it change every day. Every time I perform it, and even just like two performances ago, there's this moment where. I talk about me getting a job and paying rent, which didn't account for the, re that's, there's a much more context to it, but I realized in saying it that I was dismissing what my mom experienced five years later. That, yeah, there was a time where she was unemployed because it was 2001, <laughs> but five years down the line, she like navigated the um, uh, human services so well in Illinois that she became a social worker. And that hadn't entered the show, and I was like, I'm not, that's wrong, so I'm able to just Right? Or like, we did six performances of the Kelly Strayhorn. On the fifth one, I had a specific audience member response that affected me in a certain way. And, it, and it, it, I was like, okay, I actually need one more element from my mom back in the work. I, I like rethought about why that audience member said what they said. And it was out of love for me, not love for my mom. I was like, okay, I actually want to shift. I wanted to do love for us. <laughs> And so I added a thing back into the play that we had taken out for really smart reasons. And it was because of what was that. So I can, I'll keep changing it. And I don't know what happens if like, I'm sure someday like, a lot of plays about the fact that my mom and my boyfriend don't really know each other. Someday I hope they will really know each other. And then I don't know what happens to the play. <laughs> no, we are a new play. <laughs> in a group and say you are the lead artist of the idea and you come in with it, how much do you hold on to that or how much do you let sway and move? This might be more of a question for Liam uh, because it appears you work in groups primarily. Um, how do you dismantle that power structure mm -hmm. that is there when you are a lead artist? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so interesting because I feel like my relationship to the idea of hierarchy changes a lot. Right now, I'm really interested in the way that hierarchy is present, even if I don't want it to be. And that sometimes I feel like the abdication of, like the, the in trying to be like, there's no hierarchy, I can sometimes, um, sometimes that can be a way of avoiding responsibility. <laughs> uh, so, so that's an interesting thing that I feel like I've been wrestling with. And it's been different project to project, how much I've kept and how much I've released. These queer history projects, well, and they've all been different, like how, how much, because it's, one of them was very much like alleged lesbian activities was not created by me, it was created by a group of people, of which I was one of them. Um, and I was really explicitly co-directed it with somebody and also like had multiple writers on the project and then there were two composers on the project and so it was really a co-created project that like a couple of people walked in with the initial instigation of which I was one but not even the first one and then we all shared the question and made it together and that was hard but really worth it um, and then this project I was like what happens if I hold on a little bit more and it's been really interesting because, so I did the interviews myself as opposed to having like a whole team of people doing them. And then like wrote a text after a number of devising sessions and after interviewing all of the performers about their connection to the material and having a lot of conversations with them, then I like made a text. Um, and it's been really interesting to see how much the performers and all, everybody in the room still feels like a ton of ownership over the thing. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's interesting to me to feel that push and pull of how much, like if everybody's letting go, nobody's holding it, I think is one of the things that I'm learning. And so if I'm holding it tightly and saying like, I have it securely, but still saying like, everybody else can hold it too, <laughs> then that creates an opportunity for us to like have many hands on a thing and feel really digged in and lifting it um, in a way that feels really dynamic in this process anyway. 
And I feel like the ability for the work to change over time, actually, that you were talking about, is one of the things that's been transformative and important in this project as well, in Dance Floor as well. Like, we've been working on it for a while, and I'm like still, I'm still changing the text just little bits to fit more where the performers are at this moment in time, in their bodies right now. Um, and we've been working it over a couple of years, and so that it's grown with them, and it's been really responsive to their current emotional context, which even though it's like held by me and written by me, makes it also held by them. Well, first of all, thanks so much for this conversation. It's been so joyfully rigorous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask about more about the way you engage with designers sort of in the process. I was, I'm was i curious more, um, Liam, and kind of hearing about what it's like to bring in designers early in a process and then kind of give some time to step back and then a deal. Um, you've talk, talk, spoken about coming from sort of the museum world or learning scenic design from folks in DJ and music and the, that music world. What's been your process of designing with, uh, um, collaborating with designers and their responses to your work, way of working? You <laughs> So specifically, when I think about I'm, what I learned in a museum that I will never let go of mm. is visual thinking strategies. Mm. It's the teaching artist nerd nerd time. <laughs> it's friggin' great, and it's as simple as when folks look at a painting, you ask, "What do you see?" And then you ask them again, "What do you see that makes you say that?" So someone might look at a painting and say, "I see an ocean," but what do you see that makes you see that? I see blue. I see lines. I see darker and lighter colors, right? And really. Acknowledging that we, our brains are so amazing, we jump to big ideas really fast. Mm -hmm. And that it is valid to also go back and then I see blue. Actually, I see purple. I'm going to see green. And then that, that there's a lot to be talked about just at that level. Mm -hmm. And for teaching, it's just a joy. And, and, and that way, everyone gets to, their truth is always right. You cannot take away the fact that I see blue. <laughs> it's mine. Right. But then we can talk about, okay, so why is that there? What does it do for you emotionally? How does your truth collide with the artist's truth, with the context? And it just lets a piece like be a symphony in the way we talk about it. Right. And so the museum taught me to talk about plays like that also. And so when I'm working with designers, that is like, go back to the script. What do we see? Okay, so we see these two people fighting. What tells us that they're fighting? Oh, well, this line says this, and this line says this. How do we really dig into the thing that's right on the page? And then what do we need our design to do for us in that moment? Does the design, and um, I learned this, I think, from Caden, one of our teachers. One way they talked about design is like uh, perpendicular and parallel, right? So there's parallel design where you're trying to support the thing that's happening, and then there's perpendicular where you're trying to like vibrate against it or push against it or do a thing. So that's one binary way to think about design. So that is a question. I have learned recently that like just genre and form is like so essential. I didn't totally understand how essential it is for me as a director to understand the genres that are available in a play and then which one am I embracing and what am I doing to it and how am I holding it and pushing against it. So if I'm looking at a murder mystery, we directed a great one, <laughs> like how much of clue are we evoking when we do that and how much of clue are we like, you know, pushing against? And that's and not everyone in the room will know the signifiers, but it gives us a language to speak from. Um, and I just took this like filmmaking for directors class, and I'd never done this before. But it really, they I learned about lookbooks in the film world, so different. And I learned how much their films reference each other. Filmmakers are constantly in reference to one another. And when you look at a lookbook, they'll like you can see like the storyboarding of a whole movie based on a ton of other movies. Mm -hmm. It's like this lighting is coming from this filmmaker and this one. And even sound design I've learned is that they'll use someone else's score as a score in place to like edit the movie too. And then a sound designer gets that thing that's edited. So then their sound design, of course, is going to be reflective of the thing it's referencing. It's mm -hmm. super referential. Mm -hmm. And in early directing classes, I had been taught to kind of go taught to kind of go against that. It's like you want abstract or evocative images, which are helpful and great. But I did like straight up lookbook for my last show because the shot it was Will Arbery's Plano, which genre-wise is like all over the place. It's like what is the genre here? 
And so I just, you know, it was like, I'm like, Thelma and Louise meets Book Smart meets, <laughs> like, whatever. And looking at those images really helped the designers have some shared language and gave us a movie night excuse. And so those are some of the things I'm thinking about. <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah, I'm, it's so interesting because I feel like this actually relates to the last question a little bit for me. I, I'm thinking about what I learned from Urban Bush Women, which is like shared leadership is not no leadership. <laughs> it's like everybody being a leader in their thing. And so really thinking about designers as leading um, each in their own element and really like knowing that they are experts um, has been really fun. Uh, yeah, and then inside of that expertise, like leaving a lot of space for iteration, which means like time to be together and talking, whether that's just me and a designer or the whole team in these like machine shows, like really kind of discussing and throwing ideas at the wall and then getting folks in the room, which is such a privilege, like that's a thing that can't always happen, uh, but it's been really transformative to me even before this, uh, these past couple processes where I've done it really intentionally for a week to have designers in the room from an early point, like it actually inside of the rehearsal room, because then they can be like, oh, I wanna try this thing, and they can whisper to me or say it out loud depending on what the type of environment is, and then we can just like mock it up, you know, like trying to figure out ways to like uh, prototype something. Uh, like there are lots of cameras in dance floor, and early on we were working with like an app on phones where you can get like a camera feed, go, not just, you can get a camera feed going to your computer from this MUI app on the phone, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know all the things about it. Uh, the media designer is way smarter than that. Again, expert, leader. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but we had like these phones kind of that we were just messing around with and putting in different positions and trying to think of, okay, how many cameras are there and how do they work? Um, yeah, doing that sort of like Iteration, helping it to get playful. Um, and if there's not time, which I feel like a lot of times we don't have the privilege of time because we don't have the privilege of money. <laughs> um, but when there is enough time, then you can fail. <laughs> and when there's space for failure, then like also the really transformative things can happen. And so like trying to really um, like take advantage of that in a spacious way when it's available. for your responses and thank you for the questions we've had in the room. Are there any Zoom questions? Maybe we can have one more question in, in the 3D space uh, before we close it out, um, if anyone has a question or a thought. Where, where are these nature experiences happening? Ooh, I, um, I have dreams, but there's no premiere <laughs> yet. Uh -huh. okay. I can let you know. <laughs> Um, follow follow these two on the social social medias. Stop their stop their work. It's great. Um, I think there's a, a question back here. Yeah. Um, I live and work here in Pittsburgh, um, and I had the pleasure of seeing Amazon at Kelly Joy Horde. It was amazing. Um, but I do work at one of the bigger institutions. I work at Pittsburgh Opera, and I kind of I've loved how you're talking about you know the community. I've not been here that long either. Um, I was just kind of curious what you would like to see from some of the bigger institutions like in support of, of contemporary work, devised work, that kind of stuff. I don't know, I'm, my background is more in theater, I'm learning about opera, but I don't know like what kind of collaborations you could see or like what kind of support an institution with more um, resources might be able to give. <laughs> excited for residencies with super low stakes expectations in terms of the deliverable at the end. Mm -hmm. Where like that's the thing that Liam was talking about, this real time and privilege to fail and experiment and iterate, still rigorous. Um, the Mercury Store in Brooklyn is an example of this that I'm really excited about and jazzed about. They are like direct, they're, they're a generative space for directors and they have these like week to three week long residencies for directors. And they're, the way the founder talks about it, 
And he's like, I'm really, like, I like to limit it to one week residency because you can't finish. You cannot finish an idea. And that is specific to the objective of the project. So that you're not trying, because like the directors are like in two weeks, you're like, okay, I gotta get a show up. <laughs> so we're used to just, you, know, you give us two weeks and we'll have the, the opera done because we have to sometimes. So that kind of like, what kind of generative, generative experiences would really do that? And then also, I'd be super excited for Pittsburgh theaters to think about how, to, how can we engage our Pittsburgh artists and our Pittsburgh audiences in more and more national conversations and then more and more conversations about form and criticality. And some of that's like about connecting like theater audiences and Warhol audiences, right? There's like some intersection there and like we can talk to each other and learn things. That's about connecting Stacey Pearl's audience to the ballet's audience, which is already happening in the coolest way. And that's doing like really neat stuff. And would love, like if institutions could support, can we take five emerging opera directors in Pittsburgh to see five other operas in five other places in Philly and near wherever. And just to know that every locality is gonna have a way we do the thing. And there are different things happening in different places. Like when I go to New York, I'm like, oh, everyone got that, I like, see tube light. Okay, like now I know the tube light is the thing <laughs> here. And what, what can we do with the tube light? And so those kinds of patterns are fun to witness and I think they're really important. And I think Pittsburgh has a lot of amazing people here. And I want us to be engaged with conversations all over the place. I feel like being engaged in both like new play development and more institutional theater and um, or producing instead of presenting theater and then also being involved in contemporary performance uh, and ensemble theater. It seems to me that the difference is actually the economy that goes into around those things like Sometimes we're doing literally the same exact <laughs> processes, but they're shaped a little bit by the economy that's around it. So the resource of space that, um, like theaters that have space have, where they're used to making something in that space, and the way that like that shapes the resource that they're bringing in is the people, and that they're using a text, and so they want that sort of a no. Anyway, there, there's just like a different, versus like you make a show and you bring it to different places with the same people, you need less time, but you don't have, a, you know, it's not the text that's leading that. So that's, in, it's interesting to me that it's the economies around them that makes them different and not necessarily like the actual practice or the economies that shape the practice. So anyway, I say that to say, it seems to me that they're not that different actually and that what has happened some historically is that theaters have like commissioned ensembles to like make a piece. <laughs> and, uh, and then the ensemble does that piece there. And I don't feel like I've seen it happening a lot recently, but what I have seen is like solo performances starting to tour to larger theaters. So that seems exciting. So what I feel like could be exciting in Pittsburgh is if somebody would commission <laughs> a piece. No, but I mean, I think that uh, residencies, smaller scale residencies are really exciting um, starts. I also think there's something really interesting about being in a smaller place, um, which New Orleans is, which Pittsburgh is, which is that it kind of feels like a lot of times in order to get credibility, you have to leave, um, and that your work has to be seen somewhere else, and then it's credible. And uh, I feel like it's really transformative when arts leaders start looking in their own backyard mm -hmm. and being like, who's here? Who's doing something interesting? And maybe they haven't shown something in New York, but that doesn't actually mean that, especially with the right support, that they couldn't be making really amazing things. That it's not just because somebody's coming from a different place doesn't always mean that they have more skill. Um, they could have had more access, uh, but what they can do to kind of bring those leaders in right outside the back door. That is something I feel like Kelly Strayward mm -hmm. is really figuring out and really believe how to how to do that with us. It's like there, you know, there's so many different levels of entrance for different for artists at KST and supporting folks through time. I've been with them as an audience member, community leader, renter for 12 years. And then they they are they are deeply they are so much of why my work went to Boston. They have so much to do with it. So how can institutions be critical of that and then support the, all those things? Thank you so much for that question. Thank you both.
for your answers to that question, to all of these questions, to my questions. Thank you both for taking time out of your busy schedules this week um, to participate in this talk and, and share your insight with, with everyone here. Um, I just wanted to um, put back out into the space that Liam's show is tonight at 9 p.m. Um, at Kelly Strayhorn, which is at 5941 10 um, and there are actually, um, if you're going to the um, party later today, at the, tonight at the Mattress Factory, there will be buses um, going from that party to Kelly Strayhorn. Um, so hop on the bus, come on by, um, and, and enjoy the show. And um, our deal show is tomorrow at the Andy Warhol Museum. Um, it's at 7 p.m. Um, and I will play it back because I know that address not off the top of my head since I don't work there. Um, <laughs> one, one seven it's in Dusky Street. So um, if you would like to um, purchase tickets to both of these shows, learn more about um, the work, um, also see both of these artists' artist bios, um, you can go on Kelly Strayhorn's website, kelly strayhorn.org. Um, and we have um, both of these shows listed under our upcoming events. So we really hope that we'll see you there. Thank you both uh, for your time, your consideration, for your vulnerability, and your wisdom. Um, and I am really excited uh, to see what the two of you continue to do and contribute to the field. Thank you, everyone, both in the free space and virtually for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.